Days Gone is a 2019 action-adventure survival game developed by Ben Studio and published by Sony Interactive Entertainment. Days Gone is a masterpiece set in an open-world environment based on many real-life inspired locations in Oregon, including Marion Fox, Belknap Crater, and the Crater Lake. The beginning of the game shows the start of a global pandemic which had decimated the globe, turning millions of people into cannibalistic zombie-like creatures called Freakers. The remnants of humanity have abandoned towns to seek refuge in the wilderness to rebuild safe camps. Our protagonist, Deacon St. John, along with his best friend, Booza, and his wife, Sarah, was in farewell during the outbreak of the unknown virus. While making their way through the chaos and panic, Sarah was stabbed, hearing of an evacuation at the old brewery. The trio make their way to the roof of the building. As Nero's helicopter arrives, Deacon threatens the Nero worker, O'Brien, to take them. However, there is not enough room for all three of them. Boozer is injured and would not be able to make it on his own. Deacon decided to evacuate Sarah onto the chopper, giving her his mongrel wing, the same wing he proposed with, telling her he wants it back and promised to reunite with her. Deacon and Booza make it out of the city and head for the refugee camp the chopper was bound for. However, it was already been overrun by freakers. Being outnumbered, Deacon and Booza still managed to fight their way through and kill every single freaker. Deacon searches for Sarah but couldn't find her among the corpses. Deacon assumed that Sarah is dead and carves her name into a stone as a grave and visits her grave regularly. The outbreak caused a complete collapse of the world generating hordes of infected freaks with relatively few humans survived. Adapting to the new structure of life, Deacon and Booza took up work as bounty hunters, killing freakers and rogue humans who threatened survivor camps, offering their services in exchange for supplies. The pair did ones for several camps, including ones led by Mark Copeland, Ada Tucker, and I'm Mike. Deacon and Booza settled in an old forest service watchtower on top of O'Leary Mountain in the Cascade Wilderness. During his bike rides, Deacon catches sight of a new helicopter carrying the research team several times, leading him to believe there is a chance Sarah may still be alive. He manages to track down and confront one of the newer researchers, O'Brien, the man who evacuated Sarah on the night of the outbreak. He reveals that his helicopter was diverted to a different camp mid-flight, suggesting Sarah may still be alive. Finding out her wife's possibly alive gave Deacon a new sense of purpose to try and find her as well as finding meaning to keep on living. Without diving too deep into this very long story with multiple plot twists, in this video I will do a brief analysis of the psychology of Deacon, then discuss the key themes of Days Gone that could help us live better lives by associating with several philosophical ideas from a few great books. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel if you like the idea of learning life lessons from your most memorable video game journey. Once a member of an outlaw biker gang, Deacon comes to the Oregon wilderness already equipped with the toughness and skills necessary to survive. From street fights back in the day, he knows how to swing a bat, how to fire a shotgun, and how to handle a bike like a pro. He also has a good eye to detail and is an expert in tracking targets. Deke does whatever it takes to survive the brutal post-apocalyptic world he finds himself in as he searches for reason to live. Funny thing, when the city burned and the hordes came in, Neighborhoods at war for decades all came together, fought together. Latinos, Gueros, Chinos, Bloods, Crips. Didn't matter. Crazy what it takes to bring people together sometimes, no? Deacon is quite a complex character. Even before the outbreak, Deke had accumulated quite a lot of traumatic experience from his time in military tour in Afghanistan and has a somewhat grim and pessimistic outlook. He still carries a lot of hate and anger in his psyche. Who am I kidding? I'm gonna fucking kill you all whether you hurt her or not. Deacon still wears his biker jacket as it reminds him of the times when he lived by a coat and of the brotherhood and mutual trust he felt with his MC club and the sense of belonging he once had. Deacon still adheres to his cult. He won't attack an armed woman and gets enraged by anyone who does so. Deke values actual life and death experience and despises formal education. Despite being cynical most of the time, Deacon can still be quite light-hearted and sarcastic, cracking jokes with those he has a good report. You know what? As of today, I'm claiming this for Lost Lake Camp. The heart of the people. <laughs> Deacon was born to rebel with a defiant attitude and is prone to antisocial behavior. He's reluctant to conform to normalcy or obey orders from others. I'm giving you an order. Order? 
You see me wearing a red armband? You don't give me orders yet. You do whatever the hell you want. Deke struggled with obedience so much that he confessed he hated every minute of his military service. Deacon shows no fear for the wicked and evil. When Carlos finds out about this, there's gonna be the devil to pay. Carlos can go fuck himself! He's capable of extreme violence to the degenerates, but inside his heavily patched motorcycle vest and intimidating tattoos all over his body hides a compassionate heart. He rescued Lisa Jackson, a teenage girl who has been surviving on her own. He felt regret taking her to Taka, who was Lisa's neighbor before, as she forced her to work like a slave. She was later kidnapped by the Reapers after she ran away. Dick infiltrated the Reapers camp and saved her once again, this time handing her off to Ricky, who is kind and took Lisa to Iron Mike's camp. But he's angered to learn that she once again disappeared. Deacon has performed several mercy killings in order to spare people from a worse fate, such as preventing them from being eaten alive by freaks or being hanged by the militia. Deke takes pride in becoming a nomad. He values himself highly and acts with dignity. He isn't sure about his faith in God, but he knows the Bible well and always seeks to do the right thing without compromising his conscience. Jesus. This must be what it looked like after Noah's flood. Came and washed away all the wicked. Yeah, except God had nothing to do with this one. He prefers not to be a leader, but he leads with charisma when the responsibility is placed upon his shoulder. Once he's in the combat zone, he immediately becomes strategic, decisive, and pragmatic. I get their attention. I pull off a few at a time, and then I run like hell. And I gotta find some way to slow him down, maybe set a few traps. And then I blow him to hell. Look, two of us running around down there. It's gonna be chaos. We'll just pull the horde down on each other. No, you stay up here. You keep an eye on me. If shit goes south, you ride in there, you get me the hell out. Hmm? Unless you got a better plan. I got nothing. <laughs> He seems not to give a shit about the petty concerns others worry about. No, Deke. I always saw a bit of myself in you. Back in the day. How's that? You don't give a shit. But he's capable of delivering no bullshit himself. When he chooses to advance, Deacon was used to living the life of a lone wolf nomad. He fights best with bulls or by himself and drifts through the wasteland of the Pacific Northwest, never staying in one place for too long. After meeting and falling in love with Sarah, Deacon was willing to give up his ranks in the Mongrel MC Club to become a nomad. He chose to be less involved in the MC's operations in order to spend more quality time with Sarah. On their wedding day, Deacon and Sarah attended a small chapel in Marion Folks. Both the MC and the Sarah's family failed or refused to attend the ceremony, except Boozer, his true brother. Even before the separation of him and Sarah, there was an invisible gap between the couple as they belonged to polar opposite work worlds and shared fastly different values. Ugh, it's just this project where we've got these execs flying in from New York to audit our progress and the suits at our facility are installing a new lab without even showing me the spec. And... Ooh, well, I thought you didn't want to talk about it. Deke's new status of a nomad biker is not only embedded on his fully patched motorcycle vest, but also his way of life. Deke preferred to work independently and had difficulty fitting into the social hierarchies of the world. What is that all about, anyway? What? All the yes sirs and no sirs and the saluting and the ranks and the uniforms just seems kind of pointless, you know, considering. Hey, you were in the army once, you should know. That was different. How? Oh, there were more people in the world, I don't know, I mean, Having a military made more sense. I think it makes more sense now. Why? It's utter fucking chaos out here. We need the order and discipline or we're not gonna make it. You know, I've been at plenty of camps that are doing just fine without having a colonel breathing down their necks. You know what's funny? About uniforms and ranks seeming pointless, I mean? No, oh, what? I used to think the same thing about the MC. I mean, you guys had ranks like road captain and president. I mean, you wore badges and patches and, and tats like uniforms. I mean, when you guys used to all ride together, you looked like an army. Well, except for beards and bikes. Now that you mention it, I, I can see your point. In his two years of drifting in the wilderness, the chaos ensued in the aftermath of the pandemic caused him to be lost in the forest of his soul and wander without a sense of purpose. Most survivors are looking out for their own interest. He rarely trusted anyone and grew even more cynical, adapting to the life of a nomad drifter. Now this world is stopping anything. 
trust no one, expect the worst. I'm beginning to see your point on that. He can be extremely stubborn, never wishes for good luck, and trust no one but his own self-reliance. Don't worry about me and Boozer, we can look out for ourselves. Shit! Swarmers! I was hoping it was gonna be clear! Nah, why would we have that kind of luck? He believes in directing his own destiny and would not allow circumstances to happen to him. With an us versus them mentality, he uses his anger and hatred to fight against his enemies and unleash his inner monster on the Rippers who are out there to kill him and Boozer. Ripper assholes, come on! How about we just leave you here to bleed out, huh? Make all the freaks out here happy, yeah? Huh? Isn't that what you want? Using anger as a powerful boost to his quest on becoming unstoppable, his motto was to fight to death before defeat. Being a nomad has an advantage, as a self-centered and egotistic fighter means he doesn't give a shit about what others think. He would promptly reject other people's bad ideas without remorse by insisting on doing things his own way. I'm gonna go grab some of the guys nope. that can write. No, you're not. Now we're going in quiet. We're running to Copeland's men. I can handle them, but that wilderness up there is crawling with rippers and scumbags and god knows what else more men you know what that means that means more attention no uh-uh no we're doing this my way deke developed a mental resilience of a nomad and never bows to anyone or abandon his dignity he's not broken easily and would not settle for comfort and security fuck you that's what i want to hear means the shit hasn't broken you yet. The only thing he's running away from is his inner hero, the higher self, that wants to contribute to a greater good, but is crippled by his own self-doubt, because he's not proud of the terrible deeds he's done in the past. And you know what, you know what I think, Deacon? I think that you're, you're afraid to be here. You're afraid to be a part of something. We need you here and that scares the hell out of you. limiting his mindset to be in survival mode instead of truly embracing the abundance that life has to offer. We'll survive. Yeah, we've been doing that all right. Surviving isn't living. During his desperate search for his wife, Sarah, he endured numerous lonely nights in the wilderness as a nomad fighter. His prolonged isolation while fighting in the wasteland is detrimental to his mental health, as shown by his destructive and hateful self-talk in his head. Time and days could be too much on his own, and what's the point of having all the time and bounties in the world but having no one else to share or celebrate with? I wish you luck. Hope you're right about your old lady still being alive. She is. Well, maybe so. But you gotta ask yourself, Deke. What does it matter if everyone else is dead? I read a book once. Zen and the Art of Bike Repair. You ever read it? No, I didn't have a lot of time for books back in the day. Yeah, I ran a shop. Farewell. Made all the grease monkeys read it. Being a mechanic requires great peace of mind, it said. Try working on an empty stomach. That'll focus your mind. The book that many referred to is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persick. It's the self-told story of a middle-aged man and his son, Chris, who go on to a motorcycling trip accompanied by an adult couple. They journey from Minnesota to California, riding past Oregon Wilderness, where Days Gone is set, taking the back roads and sleeping overnight in motels or camping. The narrator describes what it's like to hear the wind moving across the plains, to see birds rise up from the marshes next to the road, to ride through a ferocious storm. Much of the book's philosophical discourse focuses on a rather surprising topic, quality. Other key ideas include peace of mind, gumption, and technology. Due to the limit of the scope of this video, I'm just going to briefly associate its key ideas to the story of Days Gone. This is when I knew. What'd you know, Ricky? That I didn't want to end up like so many of us here. We're trapped in the past or running from it. I, I just, I want to look forward. Okay, not back. This isn't what you think it is, okay? Although not directly mentioned in the dialogues between characters of Days Gone, living in the present moment by paying attention is an important theme of the story. Oh shit, look out! Shit. Oh god. Oh my god. Jesus! I 
don't know what it is, but every time I'm on a bike with you, some idiot in a truck tries to run us off the road. Oh, my God. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. You did great. You did great. Uh, most people, they would have panicked. They would have oversteered, and that would have gotten us killed. I almost did get us killed. I was... <sighs> no, no. I wasn't paying attention, and I was distracted. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Just breathe. You're okay. Wait a second. What did, what did you mean, distracted? No, it's just stuff going on at work. It's nothing. I just... Oh. As Ricky expressed, so many people are stuck in the past with their eyes fixed on the wake of the past trail or the mist of the unpredictable future rather than focusing on optimizing the present moment energy of the bike's engine. She died that night and there was nothing you or anyone could have done about it. I should have been there. And what good would that have done? Just drop it, it's done. In the book, Persic Road, we are in such a hurry most of the time. We never get much chance to talk. The result is a kind of endless day-to-day -day shallowness, a monotony that leaves a person wondering years later where all the time went and sorry that it's all gone. This is exactly the sentiment that Deacon also shares. Jesus, man, Silver Lake's been gone a lot longer than that. Yeah, yeah, it's too goddamn easy to lose track of time out of here, you know? There was a saying, Life is what's happening while we are busy making other plans. Now is the only time we have, the only time we have any control over. Peace of mind is determined by our ability to live in the present moment. Perhaps the reason Deacon seems to lack a certain peace of mind even after he reunites with Sarah is because he derives his sense of self from his ego, his inner monologue, desires and vengeful thoughts, and really gets to fully enjoy each moment with peace. Are you sure this isn't personal? Fuck yeah, it's personal. Okay. Oh, and Jim. Deacon. I'm not with her, she's with me. Hold on tight. Persic believed that peace of mind is a prerequisite for a perception of quality, which must accompany the work of bike repair. Even Deacon is not a bike mechanic. He could find more joy and peace even in everyday mundane activities if he embraced the power of now. It was good being on this shit again, you know. I gotta say, shoveling shit and you know, pulling weeds. I know maybe it isn't such a bad way to spend the day. Dick feels most at peace when he's paying attention to details while tracking and riding on his Harley. When he's riding his bike, he's completely in contact with everything. He's in the scene, not just watching it passively. On the bike, his sense of presence is overwhelming. He could literally feel the vibration between the tires and the concrete road, the cold wind blowing on his face. The whole riding experience is never removed from immediate consciousness. In the book, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle stated that you are not your mind. Our mind generates heaps of negative thoughts every day, but we could choose to let them pass. Stillness is the key to peace of mind. By rising above thought, intuitive solution would often come up and clear the cloud of our stuckness. Inner peace of mind has no direct relationship to external circumstances. It could occur to a monk in meditation or a soldier in heavy combat. Persic also mentioned gumption is the psychic gasoline that keeps the whole motorbike going. It is the substance of enthusiasm and life energy. Ego is a gumption trap. It pulls us to pointless competition that leads to all kinds of rivalry and hostility among peers, draining emotional energy. Weaver, I swear to God. What are you afraid of a little competition? God, get out! Hey, is there a problem? Ma'am. Just a friendly discussion. Corporal, Lieutenant. Having a high evaluation of self weakens the ability to accept new truth. You see, polystyrene is an aromatic hydrocarbon, while gasoline is made up of simple aliphatic hydrocarbons. You try saying that. Anyway, mix the two together, all those molecular chains break up into single covalent bonds. Yeah, everybody knows that. Deacon is an old school biker. In a conversation with Captain Corey, he revealed that he hated technology. My wife, Carrie, my father was a photographer. Old school, dark room, chemicals, all that. Too stubborn to embrace the digital age, I think. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have any photos either. Yeah, well, I hated him. Cell phones, I mean. It seemed like everyone walked around with their noses buried in the damn things. I never owned one. In his day-to-day -day communications, Dick relied on the landline in his garage before the setcoms went down. 
the good old radio is indispensable for his survival in the post-apocalyptic wilderness. The result of not having a smartphone is more focused attention, clarity, increased capacity for deep work, and less distractions. Technology is a great tool, as long as we use it well and not let it intrude our quality of awareness. Days Gone is set in Oregon with an incredibly varied landscape, having dense forest, vast expanse of snow, damp marshes, enormous mountains, and nostalgic towns. If we take the time to appreciate the scenery in the game, it sometimes will provoke a glimpse of the sublime. One night, Deacon brought Sarah to a restricted pot farm owned by the MC Club. The pair went out for a romantic midnight stroll through a forest leading to a spectacular waterfall where he proposed to Sarah. Like Sarah, when we look up at the breathtaking night sky, we can let our minds contemplate the infinity of space and the overwhelming smallness of our planet, surrounded by the mysterious glow of thousands of starlight and the loneliness of the moonlight. It takes stillness and peace of mind to open the mind to the sublime. It is easy to miss when we stop paying attention. Oh my god! What's wrong? Nothing, it's just... I mean, the view up here, it's incredible. Uh, yeah. I guess I just don't see it anymore. Uh, pay attention to it, I mean. How can you not? It's, it's breathtaking. Yeah, the world wakes up, grateful for another dawn. Hey, if you spent all day staring into a microscope, you might appreciate it more. Oh, I appreciate it. You know, being around when the morning comes up is a hell of a lot better than the alternative. Another way to experience the sublime is to think about the origin of life on Earth. How many billions of years ago this occurred? Do you remember the weekend we rode up here? To Crater Lake, I mean, after we got married. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember. I remember thinking, God, when Mount Mazama blew up, I mean, how long did it take? The lava to cool and the soil to form, all these trees to grow? When all this is over, when we leave this fucking island, I want there to be at least one tree left. Our lifetime is just a drop in the ocean compared to the fast amount of time since life on Earth began. Having this perspective, our worries will vanish without a trace. In Days Gone, I remember it's a series of storyline missions where Deacon deals with his past and plays through sweet memories shared with Sarah when they were still dating. This gives us the insight that memories lives on. Beloved people in our life who passed away still lives on in our memories and impacts us today. My grandfather was a brilliant mechanic and talented writer with the most beautiful handwriting. My parents laminated a page of his letter written to my rebellious brother back in his teenage years, hoping he would follow his guidance on living with more discipline. We can still read and cherish his words to this day. Ah, you guys are taking this shit seriously. The Colonel believes with enough motivation and discipline, we can achieve anything. In the same way, what we are doing today will live on and affect the future like an unbroken chain. We are all part of a bigger human story. I Mike's once said, We make the world what it is by what we do. All of us. So why not choose to be the light of the world by doing the next and most necessary thing each moment of every day? As long as we are doing the next and most necessary thing, we are always doing something meaningful and intended by fate. As Ricky said, The old saying, it's better to light one candle than curse the darkness. We've spent the last two years doing a whole lot of cursing. We get the lights on at last leg, and that's lighting our first candle. Ah, uh, that thing you said about uh, lighting a candle. I think maybe you were right. I know. Ricky out. Life is a one-way trip. The river of time carries us closer to death with each day is gone. Cruiser, you and I both know it's probably a one-way trip. Yeah. Then I won't have to drive back. Fuck yeah, I want this. A one-way trip of life will end before we know it. So don't give up on what you believe in. Keep trying. So you get up, you dust yourself off, and you try again. Work within the limits of your moment in history. Make the most of your finite time and talents as far as you can expand. Go and make life more luminous for the highest benefit of others by doing whatever weird thing it is that you came here for. It's an old Hindu proverb. My mother taught it to me. It reads, 
Rivers do not drink their own water. Trees do not eat their own fruit. And clouds do not swallow their own rain. What great ones have is always for the benefit of others. What do you think? Well, coming from you, I think that would have meant a lot to him. Yeah. Yeah, I think if Mike were here, he would probably say something like, what the hell does that even mean? <laughs> huh? Come on. Yeah. No, you're right. <laughs> he would have said, what the hell does that mean? Followed by, what the hell are you doing standing around here? The world ain't going to save itself. God damn it. Get right. to work. You're right again. Come on, guys. Let's get to work. <laughs> Booza and Deacon's friendship always gets them through the tough times. Before wrapping up this video, these are some of the most touching moments Deek shared with his bro. Will I be able to play piano after all this is over? Very funny, William. Lay down. <laughs> okay. I can play chopsticks. No, seriously, I could. I'd be like... <laughs> Boozer, where are you going? Oh, that's where I'm going, home. Oh, we can't home. go back to O'Leary Mountain. No, I'm not going to fucking O'Leary Mountain. I'm going to farewell. Shit, come on. We gotta get in control. No, no. You want to take a swing at me? Fine. Get in line behind them. Bring it! Okay. So this is it? This is how we're going out? out no, here, no, I don't think so. Huh, Boozer? Huh? Bro? Boozer? The nice year old lady was killed. What did I say to you? What did I tell you? What did I say to you, huh? I found you halfway through a case of whiskey. You were going to drink yourself to death. What did I say to you? You grabbed a bottle. And you chugged it. It was a lot of goddamn whiskey. And you told me that if I was going to drink myself to death, you'd be right there with me. That's what brothers do. So like I said, Boozer, is this it? That's how we're going out. Let's get the hell out of here. Stay down, brother. <laughs> Had enough? Where's your old lady, Deke? She's dead, Boozer. Sarah's dead. Yeah, and she's been dead a long time. So don't you think that you've mourned her long enough? Oh, God. I think. I think that you have a hell of a left hook, asshole. Oh. Yeah, it's the only move I got. <laughs> I gotta get my sorry ass back to work. Camp ain't gonna feed itself. It's the only move I got. Still, I tagged your ass with it three times in a row. Oh, fucking shameful. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. It's done. And I couldn't have done it alone. <laughs> and, uh, booze man. Drive carefully. <laughs> What do you think? That I'm gonna blow myself up? Something Jack used to say. Doesn't matter when you hit the road where you're heading out to, but you damn well better know where you're coming home to. You know, we never talked about it while we still wore the colors all this time out in the freak show when shit like this didn't matter anymore. Yeah, yeah but I think. Last two Mongols on Earth, farewell originals. Uh, the biker boys, most badass drifters on the broken road. Damn straight. Yeah, I guess we did become sort of a brand. The, we were a lot of things, but we were never a brand. <laughs> <laughs> when we rode out of farewell, without Sarah, without Jack or anyone. I knew that we were leaving everything behind. Everything that mattered was gone. Said this. You're a nomad again, huh? Yeah.
Yep, I guess I am. Come on, Jack. Inside, let's go. She's out there. You'll find her. Oh, but there's just one thing. Only a couple of bikers pull a dumbass stone like this. Just us. Yep. Hey. Hope you save some for me. Boozer. Sorry, I'm late. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I jumped. <laughs> no, what the fuck? You Just were... before I ran out of bridge. I saw yeah. the truck. No, no, no. I felt the blast wave. Even under 10 feet of water. Now, that was a ride. <laughs> <laughs> what? You didn't think I'd blow myself up, did you? Then who'd be around to bust your balls? I would. <laughs> hey! Oh! Hey. Little sister. Oh. Yeah, yeah, long story. Nothing's gonna stop it, Boozer. Not a goddamn thing, but... Wait, do you know why we keep going? No. Because what the hell else are we gonna do? Yeah. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and got some love inspiration from Days Gone. Comment down below which game you would like to see in the future. Please smash the like button and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on any new videos. See you in the next video.